let's, uh, let's get started. Um, thank you for coming to the uh, final lecture of the 2019 Game Center Lecture Series. Um, we do have one more event coming up on December 5th. Our artist in residence, uh, Marie Clerc of LeBlanc Flanagan, uh, will be giving uh, uh, her artist talk. So I encourage you to come to that. That'll be a lot of uh, fun. Not really fun, that's a bad way to describe it. It'll be brilliant and interesting and <laughs> strange. Um, so please come to that. Um, and uh, yeah, before we begin the event tonight, I'd like to do the ceremonial thanking of the sponsors who make this event series possible. So uh, Dots and Take Two, uh, Fresh Planet, and the Empire State Development, uh, who are the generous sponsors who uh, help us put on this series. So thank you very much to all of them. <laughs> Winnie Song is one of my favorite artists and game designers, and I'm so excited that she's going to be uh, speaking tonight. Um, Winnie is one of the very first people that graduated uh, from our master's program with an MFA in game design um, a while back, and, uh, and then went on to uh, uh, work at Square Enix up in Montreal. Um, as well as uh, doing award-winning uh, independent game design work. Um, and, um, and then recently, uh, we put out a search for uh, additional full-time faculty people. Um, and in particular, we were looking for someone who could help lead up uh, our efforts to teach uh, visual design graphics, art, um, art direction, and, and visual design. And we got a wide range of really talented, really interesting people. Um, and I was very excited that Winnie was among that group of people applying for this uh, position. And I was thrilled when it turned out that Winnie was the most qualified, the, the most talented, um, and had the, the most compelling uh, vision for, for how to, to think about uh, visual design in the uh, context of a game design curriculum um, and was, um, and with her incredible experience and, um, and portfolio, um, we were uh, super happy to welcome her on board as the most recent full-time faculty member of the NYU Game Center. So, um, hooray for that. And, um, and, and, and so it's, it's, an, it's an honor of, of her joining uh, the community here uh, as faculty that uh, we get to hear her speak tonight. Um, you know, one of, the, the, one of my jobs is to talk to prospective students and their parents uh, about the NYU Game Center and, uh, and you know, to explain what we're doing here and what, what this project is all about and why we do it the way we do it. And, and um, one of the things that I've always done uh, at, at the end of that process, when I'm, um, I want to kind of leave them uh, uh, really kind of impressed and a little bit shook, uh, I show the trailer for Winnie's game, Bad Blood. <laughs> and uh, it um, is, is amazing and, and beautiful and powerful. And recently, the, this most recent um, time that we did this, uh, Kevin Spain and I were doing this, and I were, we were watching it, and I was like, wow, this is kind of violent. <laughs> it's like, I've been doing this for years, and I just realized that it's like, is this too violent to show, you know? Um, and, and we were like, nah, nah. And, and the reason the answer there is no is because it, it, it is violent. It's a violent game. But it, it is a beautiful game. And it is a stylish and sophisticated game uh, that uses violence in this really powerful way to create beauty and create meaning. Um, and so I'm especially excited that that's the, the topic that Winnie is going to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, so, with no further ado, please help me welcome Winnie Song. Hi. 
Hi, uh, thanks for coming and thanks Frank for such a great introduction. Uh, very flattering, very uh, well, well spoken. <laughs> um, hopefully this talk will live up uh, to his uh, intro. I'm Winnie Song, uh, so as Frank said, I'm a new faculty here at NYU Game Center. Um, I'm an assistant arts professor of game design uh, and area head in training of visual design. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about my uh, work history in, uh, in video games. Um, so as you can see here, uh, right after I left uh, the MFA program, I graduated. I also taught here for a little bit as an adjunct professor. Um, and during which, and, and a little bit after, I did some freelance work uh, as game designer, art direction, UI UX, all that. Uh, and then I was called in uh, from Square Enix Montreal uh, to work on a game for them uh, as a game designer, and I did that for a year and a half. Uh, and then I left uh, Square Enix Montreal to work uh, sort of full-time uh, as an independent developer. Hardest job I've ever had, I didn't have. Um, and now I'm here at NYU Game Center um, as, uh, you know, and even though I've kind of entered the industry at a sort of recent time, I ended up somehow knowing every corner of it uh, and at almost every scale. And something of a unique perspective also is that I used to go here as an MFA student uh, during one of the earliest years, as Frank said. And since I've also taught as an adjunct as, and now as full-time faculty, I somehow ended up knowing every corner of Game Center as well at almost every scale. So some disclaimers before I uh, start this talk. This is not going to be a talk about the importance of visual design in games, be it my main vocation and expertise, uh, because as students of mine know, they get enough of that in, their, in my class, uh, and I never shut up about it. So, but I will talk about how I've used visuals in my work, uh, but as all tools of game making, as a means to an end. So, I'm going to talk about the end, uh, the reason why I'm here in specific terms at Game Center, uh, but in general terms in games. Um, and I want to talk about it in this room because I think we are all alike in our reason. Uh, we all share sort of a commonality despite our different backgrounds and perspectives. And it was because at some point in our lives, games messed us up, irretrievably. So I think the first time I realized I could make games uh, was when I played Papers, Please, uh, which was the first year into the MFA program. And it's a game where you play an immigration officer, where you have the sort of undesirable job of determining who gets to cross the border uh, in a fictional Cold War era, sort of Eastern Bloc country. And I played it in this like pitch dark of a uh, family friend's basement uh, because we're, we were living there for a holiday season uh, because a Canadian winter storm blew out the energy in our house. Uh, and I played in near silence with my sister uh, as my parents slept two feet away and we were like sort of non-verbally pointing out discrepancies in the, in, the, in the documentation. And this game kind of messed me up for obvious reasons uh, and I thought, this is what games are for. Or I think it might have been earlier, uh, before I applied for the MFA candidacy, uh, the first time I knew I wanted to make games uh, was playing the Portal series. Uh, this is a sort of a game that's like a test of logic and tenacity uh, it's a game where you're kind of stuck in an endless loop of clinical rooms, solving these like really uh, intense like physics puzzles. And and then at one point finding uh, one of those radios in a hidden corner of a room, uh, playing a song kind of tinny and distorted over a fading station. And it felt like that feeling uh, of like finding water it weeks into the desert. So, and I was kind of transported fully to this very like, you know, distant kind of cl clinical facility uh, where I was a lab rat, uh, isolated for just indeterminate years from my own kind. And like listening to music potentially for the first time ever. And this messed me up because I gratefully never felt solitude of this uh, gratitude, uh, sorry, uh, this, the scale. Uh, and I thought then this is what games could do. Or I think maybe it was earlier in middle school, uh, playing Zumbinis, which is a game about trying to spring these potato head creatures from a uh, life of enslavement, which is a concept I wasn't really cognitively aware of at the time, uh, and bring them to a sort of utopic land where they can build themselves a library and a mill uh, and live happily. But during the journey where, uh, because I was impatient or thoughtless, uh, and I failed some of the logic puzzles one too many times, and I let the Zumbinis fall into the lake, or into a pit or be kicked to the side. Um, and the game was kind of punishing those that were in my charge and not me. 
And I felt that despair that you feel when you objectively aren't good enough or smart enough to help someone escape. And this messed me up for obvious reasons. And I may have thought, this is what I am capable of feeling in games. And I have played countless games throughout those years and since, uh, but those are the ones that stand out. Um, they're not necessarily my favorite, uh, although some of them are, nor are they unique. Most of them are like vaguely blasphemous. Um, but I remember them because they just hit different than the others, among infinite others. And it's been a feeling that I've been kind of trying to identify as a game developer. Um, and the thing is, I had a game in my head or in my hand ever since I came out into the world. Uh, as many of us did, um, and I was never in want of games because I had a mom who encouraged gaming and discouraged homework. Uh, and since young, games uh, socialized and civilized me and made me rethink who I was and what games were for. So that's how I got here. Six years ago, I came to Game Center as an MFA because I wanted to make memorable games, uh, games that kind of stick with you long after you've played them, um, and games that test your limits. And games that leave you sort of totaled and bereft in the side of the street, kind of left to kind of fend for yourself and live with yourself. And Game Center was there to ask me, as a school would, and as an institution must, what do you mean? Uh, and they, they would tell me, unless you can communicate this in a way that's coherent and academic, it doesn't mean anything to us. So here's what I meant. I recently went through a formidable test of my limits. While I was still an adjunct here, uh, Square Enix Montreal reached out and asked if I wanted to work there as a game designer. Uh, and SEM is one of the best studios out there, I think, in terms of developer care, resources. Um, and Canada is generally a great place to work in games, uh, and Montreal especially so. Uh, and I was generally interested in making games for mobile, so this is a mobile sort of double A company, uh, because my family are largely mobile gamers. And I recently uh, worked on one called Enyo, which is a roguelike uh, I'd made with uh, Tiny Touchdales, uh, for which I did the art direction. And I was interested in making games at a much bigger scale than I've known, uh, and work with a much bigger team, and get played by a lot of people, make games that get played by a lot of people, uh, thousands if not millions. I can't talk much about the projects that I worked on there, uh, because of re you know, obvious reasons, but I can say it is a wonderful company with wonderful, smart, creative people. But the reason I left had really nothing to do with the company. It had everything to do with me and how I am a sort of terrible hire for a company that has to care about uh, surviving. I want to make clear, though, uh, survival is also important to me, uh, as it is for everyone in the industry, this idea of like ha every day having food on the table, having a place to sleep. But I'm talking about the difference between what I, what I need to survive uh, versus what a game company needs to survive. And what a video game company needs to survive is that feeling of, I want to keep my job. I want to keep these benefits. I get paid a real wage. I get dental, health care. I'm comfortable. I'm saving up for a house. And among these feelings, I'd go to work every day and feel more and more uneasy and guilty and worried uh, to be at this kind of amazing studio with all these resources and these, all these people and this team thinking like, am I not saving enough money? Am I saving too much money? And I realized what I actually need to survive is very different. Uh, the, 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 reason, the thing I need actually to survive is I need to be moved by the thing that I'm making. My God has to be in it, or I'll feel like I'm dying. And I learned that there was no shame in that. It's just what sustains me. And Square Enix Montreal just didn't know this about me when it, they reached out to me. Uh, and I certainly didn't know enough about myself to let them know or warn them. And I want to talk about this time I went to this uh, conference uh, called Casual Connect in my final months at Square Enix Montreal. It was a game dev conference uh, for mobile studios. It was held in London. It was very casual. Uh, it was called Casual Connect, so I feel like there should have been some kind of omen there that I should listen to. Um, it also had this indie game showcase uh, that uh, Square Enix Montreal was uh, funding slash uh, sponsoring and judging. And it was like a very stark contrast. It was like Evo being held at Vegas. Um, and I had these like bright-eyed students and like uh, indie devs come up to me and uh, you know, pitch me their game. Uh, and their hands were like clasped and shaking and like, like I held their life in their hands. And I didn't know why they were doing this and until I went to the bathroom and caught sight of my badge again. And it said Game Designer at Square Enix, which was one of the biggest sponsors at the event. And that messed me up for obvious reasons. Uh, so I escaped the talks. 
And the talks, it was this like, it was this huge conference. It was like really, really well funded. And it was made by and for survivorship bias. So these were veterans who had returned after a year, uh, triumphant or broken uh, from the war that is the free to play mobile industry. Um, and they were there to kind of regale their cautionary tales to us, what to do, what not to do. And I sat there in these design talks looking at these sort of desperate numbers and sort of shaky affirmations of the future of our industry and realized that I could not stand the apathy, the disinterest, both of creation or consumption. And I learned that in that moment that, that there's no future for me in, in games as products in thinking of them as a way to get something or somewhere. Uh, and it was very naive of me, who is, who is a deeply emotional person, to think I could work on something like that. And even if it meant being able to sort of reach a big audience uh, that I would not be capable of alone. This is a real slide from the conference. <laughs> these, are, these are all real slides from the conference. And the thing about making games as a product is that it feels like an easy goal, like uh, it, it, to make something that sells. And it's something that a lot of people will like, you know, and play for a long time. We feel like that's something that we can solve. Uh, but it's not. To survive is a really impossible constraint, uh, especially in an industry as ephemeral and fickle as video games. And it's why it's such an uphill battle for people like me uh, to get in a game idea greenlit at a scale uh, of this, a production like this, uh, because, it, because it requires so much trust from so many people. Um, you're putting blind faith in an idea that will take you through a storm. And no board of producers or studio heads or CEOs, these war-torn veterans, will sit there and listen if all you can say is, trust me, this will work, I know it in my gut. But all I have is my gut. It's been my only compass in my short years as a game maker and long years as a gamer, and I can't make a case beyond it. Uh, I can't make a case beyond this will work, this will move people, because I refuse to leave the decision up to some numbers so that we can feel better about a free fall. Because the whole value of games is that you don't know where you're going to fall, and the memorable part is the impact. But this is the paradox of game development as well, is that the only thing that's kind of undeniable and honest and understood is the gut feeling. Uh, no one can deny that of a player. But we can't solve games and its industry, so we have to trust ourselves. We have to put faith in our gut. Because the medium itself is not neutral. For me, I could not make a casual game. I am too unchill. I am too involved. I almost voted in the Game Awards this, like, a couple days ago. <laughs> and my experience at Square Enix and my trip to London made me come to terms with this gut feeling that I've been kind of living with, but ignoring. Um, I realize a new thing about myself, which is that I can't make games with the intent of sustaining, uh, of kind of being a status quo. And I make games to say something about what moves me as a player and a creator. I make games to say something about how we are wired. So here's my attempt at a structuralist take on why I make games, and it's that I make games for the gut. Uh, games that make us come to terms with our bodily function, our physical wirings, and I think it can be served as a very powerful philosophy and aesthetic that guides our development. And I personally value games based on their effect and demand on my inner biological wirings, the vital organs, the things that make us human. That is what it asks of and what it can do for my brain, heart, and stomach. And I believe there are games that are specifically made for the head. Uh, they ask for sort of real estate of the mind, ask for creative thinking, logic, rationality. It tests your concentration, mechanical excellence, your ability to achieve clarity, um, and it gives your mind work. And I must admit, I don't personally like to make games for the head, uh, as most of my people know about me. Uh, I play them still and enjoy them, but then knowing that a game has a solution that is solved in that way uh, feels a little dry to me. Then there are the games for the heart, games that present us with a story, a character, moves us emotionally. It gives the heart affectation, uh, performance, emotional engagement that tests our ability to immerse ourselves in a world, uh, like a good movie or a TV show might. And I play these kinds of games the most, despite not loving stories and games. They're an easy win with my heart, and I highly value games that make me cry or attempt to. So what should a gut game do? Should it do what these other games do for the brain and heart? Should it give sustenance? Should it, should it require a test of gutsiness? And I am reminded of these games that mess me up and what they seem to say about my ability to swallow them, to process them, to stomach them, 
And it was that there has always been a moment within these games, or an abundance of them, that made me realize that what I'm able to take as a person before a gamer. They told me, no, that's not what you are. This is what you are. Um, and they made me think about what I'm consuming, and what I'm digesting, and what I'm passing as the remains. And all I ever want to do is talk about the games that kind of make us flinch or feel drained, sick for days. And the only games that matter to me have given me a sort of bodily reaction, signaled that I'd eaten something unexpected, something outside of the ordinary. They were games that changed me irretrievably and beyond all changed my perspective on games. And they complicated what games meant to me um, and they caused discomfort and ultimately fueled my living and making experience. But to consumers also have to sort of smell, touch, and move the remains. So sort of to clean up the rot and to make peace with the waste. And that's what I should be doing as a game maker and game eater, is to be mindful of the aftermath. And to responsibilize the eater with the remains of what their consumption has left, whether it's burnt pan or bad gas. And I've learned in the course of my gaming life and career, I can endure any pain as long as it's meaningful, and so can my players. So I'm driven to make games that problematize our medium. So what I mean, honestly, by making games for the gut, I mean we're making games as a language of the viscera, uh, as a tool to talk about how we're wired. And, and that is how I've used them in defining my work. And to start with, I'm going to talk about the game I made called uh, Bad Blood. So I've been fascinated by our discomforting relationship with violent video games since my thesis project here at Game Center during my MFA program. Uh, warning, there's some violence ahead. Um, this part is a version of my talk, Necessity of Violence, I gave at Maze Berlin one year, which is an incredible game conference. Uh, several of the faculty have spoken there as well. Uh, and it's currently, I think, raising funds uh, to support its upcoming events. Uh, it may have reached its fundraiser, but I'm not sure. I super recommend you check it out. And I was there to talk about Bad Blood, uh, my first solo published work, where I explored the claustrophobia of a small map stealth game between two players. Here's the... So it became a game about violence. By release, it became sort of a compounding into an experience of a fundamental part of our body, our primal instincts, uh, fear of violence, desire to outlive, outsmart, and survive. Each round was played until one player finds the other in a field and kills them. At the end of every round, I made these sort of graphic kill screens uh, that detail the murder because I thought it looked cool. Uh, and then while developing this game, I was asked a couple times during the playtest Thursdays, why does it have to be so violent? And the question sat weird with me because it questioned the necessity of violence. The question isn't about whether they like violence in their games or not, it was about, aren't we better than this? I think this question stems not from the excess of violence in games, but because the game's employment of violence is not always convincing. So what is violence doing in video games? And I think the first thing that comes to mind is this. And I think that's natural, uh, this matter of whether violence in our media affects our desensitization to violence or whether it sort of inspires a very, um, these like fascistic impulses in us is a conversation that has been had countless times over, even as recently as this August. And it's because America lives in an era of school shootings and police shootings uh, with little hopes and sight for better gun control. And this gut instinct we get when we're playing a game with a lot of visible gore uh, and violent imagery is, is that it's one of the ways that games are moving us. It signals to us that games shouldn't be this. But despite our natural repulsion to violence, the majority of video games are built on the foundation of it. Um, and despite rational thought repelling us from them, we are also kind of drawn, and we revel in the feeling of brutalizing another. So it's prudent to ask why first. Why do we make violent video games? Because our relationship to them is more complicated than this dialogue we're having about it. 
And as far as violent games go, Bad Blood is not that violent looking. Uh, it's not particularly bloody. Uh, it's certainly not realistic. But something about it uh, makes sort of uh, makes us all tick a little bit. Uh, even those with really iron stomachs, like full-grown adults, they flinch, they yell, they run in opposite directions. I think it's because what violence is actually doing in video games is this. And I remember this game. It came with our Windows 95. I played so much of this game, I would come back to it every single day. Um, and it's a game where you're a mouse and you push around these blocks and you try not to get eaten by these cats that spawn. As a five-year-old, this was very traumatizing, obviously, and it was because uh, this, this fear of the cat, who was a sort of deadly force, it was ever moving towards you, nothing could stop it, and some, it can also travel diagonally through blocks. Um, and the panic I felt as, as a potential for violence junior is still alive in me, uh, and I felt crazy coming back to it. And even today, after years of gunning down Nazis and parkouring over dead bodies, I'm on edge just looking at this. But something I failed to realize at the time is that I am also an aggressor, uh, and one of the m with more advantages than the cat. I can move these blocks around. I can kind of uh, cage these cats in and kind of turn them into cheese. And so the way to win this game is to come to terms with one's own violence, one's own ability to aggress, and to start using it effectively. Uh, it is to learn to be violent. And I think about most of the violent games that I've played and have loved since is that they're not really about violence. They have violence in them, uh, but it's not, never the focus. There are more often exercises in tact, uh, you know, precision, moderation. They are dark games wearing the mask of brutal carnage. So it's difficult to kind of feel at risk in these kinds of systems that feel like you're kind of wrestling with the rule book. Uh, and it's, it's one way, ultimately. Um, it's, it's, I am more affected by getting checkmated. And often games try to justify its own violence through heavy-handed moral lessons. These are games about the consequences of violence with mechanics and narratives that are there to show how bad violence is. They make me murder people thoughtlessly and they remind me to feel bad about it and ties a kind of bow around the whole thing, absolving me of responsibility. Other games try to do with moral consequences altogether by pandering to my bloodlust while giving me a moral loophole. These are not people. Uh, and sometimes they switch out you know, humans for aliens or blood for oil. And I feel like these are the games that kind of try to desensitize us to the, to the side of massacre at our hands, of blood and guts. And they make our enemies sort of brainless and kind of other and heartless by accentuating uh, these qualities. These are not violent games. Nothing about it reckons with the act of violence. And even the games that are, are about violence spend a lot of time making excuses for it, making sure we don't feel like we're being aggressive or a bad person, and assures us that our acts are justified. But when is violence justified? When I was making Bad Blood, uh, I watched a lot of nature shows, and it had you know, David Attenborough kind of tell me about all the laws of the natural world, where the act of violence is held with the same kind of dignity uh, and kind of necessity as playing and resting and caring for family. I watched a lot of Tarantino movies, samurai comics, TV shows like Vikings, where the violence is both the main aesthetic and also foundation of society. Murder existed in the media for as long as media existed, for as long as there were people on Earth, and violence is as much a capacity in us as empathy is or hunger is. It's really unnecessary for games to compensate for, for its excess. They just need to be a bit more convincing. And the visuals of a game, I think, is, a, is always a means to convince. Uh, it was important that the main actors in my game uh, were visualized by these people uh, who are hungry and angry and out for blood. I wanted Babla's main sort of narrator to be visceral and extravagant human violence. Because humans are both passionate and vulnerable, I wanted to encourage this behavior in players. I wanted them to play as characters that want to live just as much as they do. I wanted them to take it as personally as these characters. It was important that the players looked and felt like an extension of the players' bodies. So the characters looked and felt like extension of the players' bodies. Uh, so that I can figure out, as a developer, why do I believe about the, the people who are playing this game? Uh, what do I want to say about them? Uh, how will they act in a situation? What can they take? What is their makeup, their innards? Will they hide or will they fight? Will they be surprised by what they are capable of, the way that I was surprised uh, playing Rodent's Revenge? And I use visuals not to abstract the feeling of violence, but to make it louder, to emphasize the essence of it, to make it the main event. Because the problem with violence in video games is not its excess, it's the apology. 
The presence of violence in a video game is there to remind us of what we are capable of doing and what can easily and in equal measure be done unto us. And my intolerance of an other and their intolerance of me and that geometrical space between us shrinking and that, you know, that chance that our intolerable uh, qualities will kind of clash and do, we'll, we'll do something about it. And games where you know, the player doesn't feel like they can receive the same kind of violence onto themselves are kind of meaningless. And you know, violence, if it's you know, constrained, it feels kind of excessive, but frustrating when it's you know, not there. And even just the threat of violence can drastically affect the way we behave in a game. And I think this is the true purpose of violence in games at its most effective. It convinces the player of the game charade, forcing them to assume their role so completely that their lives become sort of inseparable from that experience. And ultimately, it's there to kind of you know, take away the layers of complexity and arbitrariness uh, between the player and the controllers. Uh, it's to kind of make the players live in the world uh, as if they were born into it. And there's no mechanic better at making us forget about the video game than consider the wiring that's within us. And living with violent games have you know, made me understand myself better, how my more mind works to keep itself alive. And my favorite games have been the ones that kind of ridicule the idea that I have any control over my own gut, that I can act rationally in high tension situations. I live with the games that say, no, 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 this is what you are. And what we are is violent. We are violent creatures. We think about it every single day. Aggressive behavior is human behavior. And violent games are a product of that, not the source. So how do we come to terms with our own violence? How do we see it through? Because we live in a sort of era that's saturated with violence, highly focused on the subjective, acts of terrorism, domestic, school shootings, which live hand in hand with the sort of brutal forms of social violence and systemic violence like police brutality, immigration control, war. The good news is we kind of do this all the time through video games. We exercise these other parts of us like greed, lust, gluttony, and pride. Why not our bloodlust? And I think games are the perfect medium to exercise these parts of us that we feel kind of uncomfortable looking at straight on. Because video games are the only medium where we can explore an inherent part of our biology with very little context and just the time and space to, to kind of talk about it. And we don't, you know, have to, ha we don't have to have this like objectivity. Um, and we can, in games, instead of simulating the full context of the act, all the politics and all the kind of scary, you know, subjective forces, we can simulate just the essence. We can access the feeling, in this case, sort of the awareness of our own vulnerability uh, and susceptibility to violence, both as a perpetrator and a victim of it. So I think instead of celebrating and advocating for the non-violence of video games, we should consider the language violence provides to talk about what makes us us. What violence can say about ourselves both as human beings, beings that are, as we've not established, violent by nature, but also as players who are smart enough to distinguish what precise part of violence gives us catharsis. And I think violence in video games can be a language of the viscera, and it is worth more than a question of its sort of necessity. It deserves a question that is not truistic and dismissive. It doesn't deserve measure by the amount of red on the screen. Violence is there to erase the boundary between human biology and the controller. To employ violence well in games convincingly is to incite fear and give catharsis, not cultivate a tolerance. To deny it as a fundamental part of humanity and society would be dishonest and dangerous. So that's my game Bad Blood. Uh, honestly, I didn't intend to make a violent game uh, with Bad Blood, but it ended up being sort of, uh, sort of a playable treatise of who we are as violent beings. And my current next venture uh, is into love. As you can see, my business is in covering huge undefinable concepts that I have no business covering. But just as with Bad Blood and every game I've ever made before, I have an undeniable feeling as guidance. So the game is called Love Game. It's a dating game about love, which I think is a paradox. It's a work in progress with my playwright sister. There's only one real decision in this game, uh, and one with a real consequence, and it's to whether you stay with a person or leave. Uh, and then you're gonna live with the result of either choice. Every other choice in the game is cosmetic. And it's because, I made this game because I believe we all have monstrous flaws. Uh, things we tend not to reveal on our first date with someone, not necessarily the hundredth, 
that reveal themselves when we start to see someone for real. And similarly to Bad Blood, I'm aiming to make a game about love rather than a game that gestures at it, a voice talking about it directly. I am to have players come to terms with their own wiring, to discomfort and complicate what they know, what they're sure of. And I've been trying to identify the gut feelings that I can access through play, narrative, visuals, and I've been doing a lot of research. The thing about a lot of dating games, at least the ones that I've been playing, is that they are about capitalism. It's about getting players to pay money to have experiences and dates with hot people who happen to want to date them back. And I've devoured these games like a good romantic. I pined after pixels and agonized over choices and mashed that gift button until I got what I wanted. But it was never love. It was barely dating. And I think love is a much kinder, a much more physical, visceral thing than capitalism. And I want to make a game about love as a decision. Most of these games are about an object of love, their lovability, someone's you know, you know, ability to be loved. Uh, which is ultimately conditional upon the object, not the player's faculty. And love game will turn the question around and ask the player with increasing gravity, can you love this person? And the game will be a power fantasy about our capacity to say yes to the terrifying horror game experience of knowing and being known by another. And I think no game fundamentally changed me about my perspective on love than games that had no dating in it never talked as clearly about sort of a lack of love and understanding as the game loved, uh, where obedience and subservience earned me acceptance from a, from a narrator, but narrowed my world down uh, with known dangers and fears. Or told me about the messiness of commitment and the social constructs we devote ourselves to seem normal in the eyes of others and not like a clunky AI. Easy to love, easy to understand the way Facade did. And I played like three body problem on Congregate for like 20 total hours, reckoning with an uh, sort of other that I manipulate uh, directly by my own actions. And it was the thrill of being kind of chased and a devastation of being tangible and being hyper aware of my own body and, it's as, and as a force upon another person. Or sitting in the uh, sort of empty game center library uh, with my classmate Sig until two in the morning playing Towerfall co-op and we were sharing the last dregs of our arrows by bumping our characters together uh, while avoiding hellfire and lasers, and dying on the penultimate level time and time again, but hitting retry without a word, whoever's fault it was. I learned more about love and forgiveness and acceptance in those wasted hours than in any dating game that I played. And I'm inspired by these games precisely because they tell me that the games I thought and perceived as about love was not. And I've also identified the feeling that I want in my games in other media. Uh, I've watched a lot of Succession, where a family does sort of unspeakably cruel things to each other, uh, but are tied undeniably by the sort of realist, the most basest, uh, misguided love a person can have. Uh, or movies like Mad Max, where true affection and respect is felt most poignant in small acts, such as handing over the sniper. Or moments of, sort of pure understanding, as in Procoroso, where a character briefly glimpses through someone's curse. Uh, Treat Me Like Your Mother, which is a music video that demonstrates a relationship between two people uh, by having them stand 20 feet away and empty the contents of an AK into each other uh, until you see holes. And the presence of love that is felt in these when it is felt kind of despite all else. And that's what I'm looking for in this game. It's a feeling that love is a muscle. It's an act, a practice, an exercise, a decision we must make and kind of repeat every single day. Uh, and I think I'm interested in exploring love in its excess, uh, excess over abundance, whether it's understood or misunderstood, misdirected. And I'm still figuring it out. And I'm figuring it out in a kind of sort of process of elimination. And I think there are so many ways of making a game, and I, and I tell this to my design students all the time, there are infinite solutions to a design problem. And so you have this like long gestation period uh, and where you're like this close to your game and trying to figure out what it needs to be. And you start to worry about the stupid things like whether anyone will like it or whether it will feed you and care for you. Uh, and also as game developers, we're already kind of misfits. Um, coming out into the world with a gut feeling seems like something that's really, really difficult, um, almost impossible uh, to feel a certainty. But I think certainty is the only thing that's gonna get you through these development uh, periods which is why I kind of encourage this method of thinking about games, where a games that actually truly move us changes our expectations, or at least the perception of what games should do. Uh, it change, you know, we have to kind of, it kind of debunks games. Uh, to make a game for the gut is to kind of fundamentally 
you know, uh, kind of de debunk games a little bit, what they mean. To celebrate them is to un kind of unmake them. And to make games is to define them. And to define a game is to say no to everything else. And to make games is to ultimately to redefine ourselves as players, figure out what is our nature, what makes us tick, and accept our biology unchanged in philosophy from its conception. And because this is a new faculty talk, I should talk about why I came back to NYU Game Center. And the fact is, Bad Blood uh, could not have been made anywhere else. It could only have been made here. Uh, here, a consistently sort of unchilled community of people who would question what the purpose of a game that unwieldy, that inaccessible, and that abrupt is, and what life it has in the institution of games. It was a sanctuary for a growing artist where it encouraged uh, the feeling of discomfort and uncertainty and indigestion in the development of games instead of tamping them down, implicating them with false ideas about what is known and certain. And Game Center as a school, as a community, as a home, understands and appreciates that making games for the gut is a really difficult thing to do. Uh, certainly not a comfortable or a casual thing to do. It's nearly impossible. But it also believes that it is a worthy endeavor. And I'm inspired by my peers and students who attempt it. And I'm excited for my future here as an instructor and creative, making and playing games that make me reconsider everything. Thank you. That was beautiful, thank you. Um, well, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to the crowd for Q&A. Uh, one of the things I loved about what you were saying is it's kind of anti-theoretical in a way, yeah. right? Skeptical of theory, of the theories we tell, the stories we tell. Um, however, I'm going to bounce some theories of violence off of you just to see what your reaction is. Um, okay, the Aristotelian theory of catharsis, that we enjoy violent art because we need to exercise these things and get them out of ourselves. What do you think of that theory? I, I believe in that theory. I think that's the thing that I was trying to say okay. uh, through that talk, uh, the necessity of violence, but also in this one, is that uh, the reason why we are so drawn by violence in video games, despite uh, everything else, every rational thought telling us that we should hate it and feel it disgusting, uh, is because we do need to get that out of ourselves, uh, because in a very fundamental part of our biology, uh, violence is a muscle. Uh, it's something that we are capable of doing. I think even the nicest people in this room, uh, if kind of driven to do it, if they're kind of cornered, uh, will do the worst things mm -hmm. to another person. Mm -hmm. uh, we have that muscle in us, and that's something that, unless we kind of exercise, mm -hmm. both exercise and exercise uh, through play, um, is going to come out in the, in the wrong time, I feel mm -hmm. like. Okay. Um, what about the alchemical theory, which is that violence is like an ingredient, and art transforms it into something else? So football, as a, as a game, uh, takes the violent impulses of young men and transforms them into something like ballet. What do you think of that theory? I'm convinced by that theory, okay. especially in the, in the kind of uh, example that you've used. Um, I think it, talking about a sort of an element uh, that can be present in a lot of these games is, is true, but I think a chemical in the way that it also uh, uh, chemicalizes something in our brains, uh, which is like for example, I think the, the whole, um, speaking about sports, like hockey also has this like kind of side sport, which is that uh, when two of the, the bruisers uh, kind of come together and they like fight it out. Mm. Uh, and that used to be something that's like illegal in that sport yeah. because we found such catharsis in it as viewers and players, uh, it became sort of part of it. Um, so I guess the, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, oh, well, here's another theory about yeah. hockey in particular. Okay, sure. Um, there's a theory that hockey has, has a lot of violence in it, has a lot of fighting in it, yeah. um, because it's so dangerous. That the sports with fighting in them uh, are like hockey and baseball. The fighting is there because those are games where you can die. You could, in, in hockey, you're traveling at great speeds with a big stick and sharp you know, blades on your feet. Um, and so you need something other than rules. 
Uh, you need something greater than rules. Like the official rules say you can't do this, you can't do that. We're used to bumping up against the rules. You need this sort of unspoken set of norms that go beyond rules, and those have to be enforced not by the referees, but by the bruisers. Do you like that theory yes. of, of uh, violence in, in hockey? It's interesting that you're saying as if like the bruiser is the sort of gatekeeper yeah. that's kind of preventing it from kind of crossing the line. And that's interesting. Do you think it's because like the bruiser is trained to cause violence in a non-permanent way? Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think that's the way this, this theory works, right. that there's a, there are people on the, the team who are not even very good at hockey. Right. Their job <laughs> yeah, is, and, it, and everyone knows it. Yeah. But you don't say it out loud. You don't write it down no, no, like no. in the official rules. But their job is to... Um, to enforce these kind of unspoken rules. Yeah. And it's the unspoken rules that, that we need. Uh, we don't have them in basketball. We don't have, typically, we don't have fights in basketball because it's very hard to actually get seriously hurt in basketball. But in baseball, where you can, you can kill someone with the ball, um, that's where the fights happen. If you throw the pitch, um, you know, that's, that's dangerous. You know, that's, that's where yeah. the fights happen. Yeah, so I think, it, yeah, there's that, like, classic thing of like like watching wrestling games or like even as early as like gladiator fights where these uh, these people are kind of serving as our avatars because we don't personally want to feel pain uh, we don't want to uh, have you know someone take uh, our bodies and, and cause pain and it's sort of personal in that way so we want to have this kind of extension of our uh, of our uh, need to cause violence um, through these players uh, so I think I think the thing about having uh, these uh, kind of uh, avatars or people who are kind of serving as our kind of extension of our muscles is kind of crucial for, uh, I think sports in general is, is just all that. Yeah. It's just so that we can feel the dangers of like losing uh, sight and like breaking an ankle and things like that without ever actually, you know, uh, it, you know make, taking that chance personally. Yeah. That's what I mean. Um, do you enjoy sports? Do you watch sports I, at all? I watch some sports. Um, I watch some soccer. Uh, I tried watching a little basketball, but I think the, the court is way too small for me uh, in that it just like takes so little time to Matt, get... Matt Parker is hurt, yeah. physically hurt by that. <laughs> I, like, I like when things feel like a journey to, to mm -hmm. get to a score. And it's like, it's like, it feels like such a... It's like a whole story from going from one end of a soccer field to another uh, or a football field to another. So um, now, did you grow up in Canada? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, I moved there when I was nine. Okay. Yeah. Um, and do you think of do you think Canada has a presence in your in your identity as an artist and as a creative person? Do you feel like I think there's I'm, a cultural aspect that's that's Canadian that gets expressed? Yeah, I think I think me being a, a Canadian, a Korean Canadian, is a, is a huge part of. Uh, I think it's also just the fact that I'm not a uh, Korean American. Mm -hmm. That distinction is also what defines me. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, being in a sort of a melted pot country uh, where uh, being um, Asian isn't like, is sort of a, uh, it's like, it's not a, I feel like I was in a society, uh, sorry, a town, I grew up in a town that was very, uh, the population was very Asian. Mm -hmm. uh, so I never felt like I was out of, uh, you know, the loop or out of the kind of cultural, um, uh, kind of makeup. mainstream. Yeah. So uh, I, I feel I do feel a little bit. I, I get invited to kind of places where I'm asked to speak about my Asianness and um, Amer Korean Americanness, and I can't speak to that because I'm like I don't know what that means. So, um, what what are are there aspects of uh, Korean culture and Canadian culture that? Um, came together easily, aspects that you felt were at odds, and how, how do you feel like that gets reflected in, in your own work, if at all? I don't think uh, the fact that I'm Korean gets reflected in my work at all, but I think definitely uh, me being Canadian mm -hmm. uh, is something that kind of uh, affects it in that, um, I don't know, I, I grew up in a very suburban uh, town um, and I like, was in a sort of really secluded community of artists. Uh, I, w I went to an art school that was very small. Uh, so things like that, I think, where I feel uh, more open to kind of talking about um, my feelings uh, and the things that drive me as an artist uh, in a way that's not, like, I think, restricted by, by who I am and things mm -hmm. like that. So uh, Canadian identity is to be uh, not have an identity. 
Okay. Yeah. So, so you're just me. Uh, okay, here's how I would propose it. Okay, cool. Um, that I feel like your work is has a lot of strength. It has a lot of power. And I feel like a lot of that might come from a sense of groundedness. That I think of Canadian culture in, as, as um, having stability. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, this is obviously, uh, you know, reductive to talk about nations having identities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think that places yeah. um, do influence us. And growing up in a place, it does feel like um, you, your work comes from uh, a sense of confidence, a calm, a centeredness. Um, that feels kind of Canadian to me. Is yeah, that I would, uh, make I mean, sense? That would make sense, but I, I, I'm reluctant to credit me being Canadian to that. I think I would yeah. credit that to having a very uh, a close relationship to my family. Yeah. Um, with, uh, um, I think being able to talk, having just someone in your life from conception until death who gets you, I think is a real privilege, and it's something that I feel like um, a lot of us don't have. Uh, so I think that's the thing that has given me that kind of strength and stability. Uh, sort of a kind of launching point uh, where I can kind of enter into the world strong and armored because yeah. I am loved. Yeah. When you were growing up, did you ever encounter violent uh, art in cartoons or in film or in comic books that disturb you? I'm, I'm remembering, I think my relationship to violence is so much about like two or three like key things that I encountered when I shouldn't have and they still are in there. Can did you name you one? I read, when I was a little kid, yeah. I don't know how I got a hold of it, but I, I read some um, uh, manga, some Japanese comic. It was even maybe just a frame or two yeah. of a manga with a, with a guy, and it was a fight, and the guy got like his face plunged into the pointed sticks of a oh, tree, yeah. and they went into his eyes. I'm sorry, it's a terrible image. <laughs> maybe it's not that big a deal, it's just in my head, it's like this monstrous thing. Mm -hmm. That still is in there kind of rattling around, and I, I, you know, I, I was just curious whether... Even cartoons, you know, can be can be quite violent. Do you remember any of yeah, that? I think I think I was exposed to kind of uh, violent imagery pretty early. Uh, I watched a lot of, um, I read a lot of manga as as you did, uh, as well as like watching a lot of like uh, gangster movies. Um, so movies that are uh, uh, kind of like, you know, meant to meant to kind of like aestheticize and kind of fetishize violence. Um, I think to name. Uh, I mean, I watched a lot of Quentin Tarantino, as I said. Um, I watched, I read, um, uh, what's that called? Uh, Vagabond, um, which is a very, very balanced manga uh, where, I mean, I think that's like the main kind of driving force of that narrative is that uh, to kind of make progress in that story is to kill a bunch of people in a very, very violent way. Um, so, and I think like, because I was exposed to it so early, I was a little bit like, uh, it felt like kinship. It felt like something that I grew up with, like, like family. Uh, so I'm not overly disturbed by, by uh, uber violence uh, in the way that I maybe I look like I should be. Um, <laughs> but... Um, you seem like you have a healthy relationship yeah, 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 to this exactly. stuff. How about nowadays? Are you drawn to horror films or, I don't know, like I'm thinking Gaspar Noé or, or some of these, the, the cinema of difficult, you know. Um, I'm, like I'm, I think I'm truly not. Uh, precise, it, was, it was a, re I think, moment when um, I was exposed to the Saw series mm. and something about that like sat t like badly with me because it felt too like, like torture. Something that I don't like is like torture porn, mm -hmm. uh, which is when uh, we just take like glee from mm -hmm. someone's just absolute uh, you know, pain. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, as I said in, in my talk, it's like I can endure pain as long as it has meaning. Mm. Uh, so I feel, and the thing about some of the violence uh, stuff that comes out is that uh, I see really no purpose in it, at least for me, on an emotional level, what that's doing yeah. on the screen. Um, yeah, I felt that way about song. I felt that way about Dexter too, as a line I didn't want to cross. Really? I could tell it was a good show, but it yeah. was like, nah, this is not for me. It, it just feels like such a like, like a gimmick. Something that they're just putting on there as a hook, being mm. like, "Hey, here's a here's an image, like take take that." I don't think so. Um, all right, let me let me try one more theory on you. I'm trying to find one that you don't agree with. Okay. Um, <laughs> the fuel theory of violence, which is that a work of art is a complicated machine, and part of what it needs to make it go are certain kinds of primal or atavistic qualities. So even if you have a very sophisticated film, for example. Um, many of the most kind of challenging avant-garde films are still about gazing at attractive people, right? And like 
tapping into yes. that kind of primal energy. And, and so maybe um, violent media is, is like that. And, it, and that's, it's using these impulses in order to make a machine go. And then the machine is doing something maybe orthogonal or just like uh, arbitrarily different. Do you like the fuel theory of violence? I mean, something about the, the, the reference to like a machine uh, kind of insinuates that it's like, uh, like a means to an end. It's like, a, it's like yeah. an inevitability that yeah. uh, violence has to be in this work of art. And I, I guess I don't believe in that. Uh, in that, uh, the thing that I've, I guess I'm trying to say is that the moment we forget that the violence is the point, that's where the, the, the violence presence is just moot. It's okay. Just meaningless. Um, so like for there to be violence on the screen, it has to be sort of uh, the thing that's kind of the main event, right. at, least, at least in games. And we don't sure. drink fuel. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what misses about yeah, that theory exactly, for you. Yeah. Um, what about Steven Pinker's theory of violence? Right. That, so Steven Pinker has written that we are... Um, Ex uh, hu human civilization is is uh, is moving away from violence. We're at an all time low. So the better angels of our nature um, is his theory that even though we look around and we see violence, we see school shootings, we see this you know uh, cops killing people, and we see um, that in reality the world used to be much much more violent, and we are traveling down a very sharp slope uh, towards a less and less violent world. Does that ring true to you? Yeah, I think. Uh, but I think the reason why that's happening isn't because we are getting becoming better people, or like be, be, getting civilized, uh, or uh, we are now enlightened in a way that we weren't before. I think it's that we are exercising that in a in a way that's possible through things like games and through things like media. Mm. Um, and uh, I think just and I think that's why we have to do right by our own people, uh, so that um, we don't forget that the fact that we once did uh, sort of unspeakable violence to each other uh, for ultimately not great a, a reason that we are doing now. Um, There's not a great difference from the reasons that we're doing now. And um, I think we as media makers and art makers, we have to like talk about uh, the fact that, that that kind of biological presence in our, in our system, that philosophy is kind of unchanged ever since we were like uh, sort of caveman days. I think we are still the same kind of uh, makeup. Um, it's just that we have all of these kinds of outlets and we have uh, the ability to kind of talk about it um, in a way that's not so personal and subjective. Um, and I think it's as, as game makers, I think we have a huge right and also a privilege and also the power uh, to kind of form the language in which we talk about violence in us um, in a way that, you know, makes sense and, and kind of like helps us come to terms with the fact that that's still there. Mm. Um, so I guess I don't believe in that. Nice. Uh, we are fundamentally getting less violent mm. uh, over time. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your process. Uh, the, we saw those gorgeous notebooks that you had, those beautiful drawings. <laughs> um, how important is that, uh, is, is hand drawing to your process as a game developer? Yeah, um, I think I... Uh, started the practice, I think when I first started sort of hand drawing, um, I actually employed this rule of like never drawing in pencil. I only drew in pen, uh, which was like, I didn't know if I meant to do it, but I did, did do it. That, that's why I kind of developed a skill of like not drawing to ever erase. Um, and I think like uh, that's kind of my also process in game making and, and other kind of art making is that uh, I intend, when I make a mark, I intend not to really go back. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's not like a fundamental part of my development process, but I think the, the, that was sort of the starting point for Bad Blood, where I drew these characters that I really related to and also felt there was um, sort of a narrative power there that I wanted to talk about. So I drew those characters, and I was like, well, what are these, guys, what are these characters wanting to say? Uh, what, are the, what are they feeling? And the first character that I drew was Hunter, is that he, his whole energy was that he was hungry. His dog was hungry. And I was like, but for what? It's because for, for humans. And, and, so, um, and so I added him to the game. And I added, with that addition, I started to draw these other characters who were going to kind of compliment and talk about these kind of human qualities in themselves. Um, yeah, and I does think that, yeah. does that carry through that? So that commitment to the stroke, yeah. that commitment to the gesture, uh, does that carry through once you start working in digital media? Because obviously, Photoshop, for better or worse, is sort of infinitely yeah. plastic. It exactly. wants more than anything 
for you to undo every stroke and do it again. And but do you have that same feeling of yeah? I do have that same. Commitment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't think I. I hit undo very well because I think until very recently the undo in Photoshop was like singular, like you can only undo and then redo. Mm. Anyway, old school. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, but I did use uh, like negative space. I do use the eraser tool to to do that in a digital form. Where I was like, uh, I would draw something and then if I didn't like it, I would like use the eraser to kind of yeah. undo it. That's right, that's like the undo as a stroke. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. 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 <laughs> um, are you, uh, do you look at other artists, other visual artists? Are there things that, um, that inspire you uh, that, that are, um, yeah, that, that you're looking at currently? Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously I've been inspired by a lot of like uh, manga as, as youth, um, but I also, I draw a lot and look at a lot of like fan art uh, of uh, of media that I enjoy uh, because I feel like uh, only when I'm invested in the in the content uh, can I really enjoy the the form. <laughs> um, so yeah, I do, I do a lot of that. Uh, and in terms of like um, visual artists that I'm really into, uh, I think I think illustrators of um, like book covers. Those are the things that I kind of follow on Instagram. Um, I think. Again, like because I'm a graphic designer uh, by trade initially, so uh, I think applied design, design for the, the, the for an end, whether it is a book or um, a movie or, or anything like that. I think that's what I'm uh, most uh, moved by. It's interesting for me to hear you say that manga yeah. um, and I guess anime are, yeah, yeah, yeah. are visual influences on you because I actually don't see a lot of that in your work. I, I see that as such a big ingredient for a lot of contemporary design. Yeah. And um, I think one of the things that makes your your visual design uh, stand out is that it, it kind of doesn't have a lot of the, the markers of, of that um, style. Um, I see um, a kind of a lot of a lot of classic graphic design. I see a lot of uh, influence from uh, the 60s, uh, designers of the 60s. Um, I don't know if you know Saul Steinberg, the illustrator and cartoonist. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. For some reason, I see, I see that some, in some of the details mm. of your line work, but um, is that older stuff uh, at all an influence on you? Uh, I think, I think actually, I think this is like a misconception about I think people who grew up with uh, manga and anime is that a lot of the artists that we see that we feel like they have not gotten any influence from those uh, from um, uh, from those things is actually they they did it mm. is that they work through them. Hmm. Uh, you're seeing the sort of result of them uh, being really really passionately into it and being driven by it and being inspired by manga and anime and then working that out of themselves in, in a way that's like uh, that's like a process uh, processing that um, all the essences and all the aesthetics of manga and anime are still there it's just that it is in the form that I'm uh, that I that I want to be represented Interesting. as yeah I say I guess there's a kind of a stylized end yeah. of anime I mean, like ping pong the animation if you know this yeah, yeah, I do. this series which is i think gorgeous yeah. and that kind of reminds me that, that that end that is more expressive and stylized yeah. and kind of less formulaic yeah 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 um let's uh let's open it up sure. uh and see if there's any questions from the audience why don't we start over here um, i'll bring a mic I was just going to ask about when you were saying that deconstruction is um, key to gut games. Um, was were you thinking about that in the pre-production or development of Bad Blood or any of your other games, or is that something that just kind of comes up? Yeah. So I think uh, what I mean by kind of making games that are meant to kind of debunk games or, or what you think of as games is something that I think has to happen if I. At least for me, if I want to put out a game, um, if a game is if I'm putting out is uh, saying the same thing that any other game would uh, about uh, what I'm trying to say, is that I don't really see it doesn't move me in that sense. So I think definitely in some like subconscious form, when I was working on Bad Blood, I was trying to be like, well, what is this game not, uh, and, and what is it saying about uh, what games should not be? Um, and so I, I took a little bit of that, uh, and a lot of that comes from like taking a look at things that are outside of games uh, and the things that move us outside of games so things like um, it could be film or it could be uh, something as like like a folk folk game like I played a lot of uh, hide and seek as I said and I think I wanted to bring that into it as well as like um, again like uh, what is the sort of uh, the, the kind of the thing that I think constrains us as artists is like trying to make something that fits into an institution um, 
And that's the thing that I kind of want to discourage in myself because I, I feel that. I feel that instinct to be like, I want to make a game that's going to be accepted uh, and to be something that's like beloved and sell well. Um, but it's, it, but I also have this other instinct of like, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be something that's can kind of fit uh, into a mold. Hmm. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, is the media you in, you consume to be moved the same media that you consume to enjoy? I think uh, in some parts, yes, because I think the the parts of uh, the media that I uh, the reasons I watch certain kinds of media is so that I am moved, uh, and the enjoyment comes from that. I guess uh, is like being surprised or being like uh, kind of shaken. Um, and uh, to realize something that's very uh, new about myself by watching this thing. Um, obviously, I think there is that in, like, instinct to kind of shy away from things that might change me at uh, the same way like we are all afraid to change, um, which is why I think like whenever I, I hear someone say like, oh, that movie is good or that TV show is good, I'm immediately being like, well, I don't want to be changed right now or I don't want to um, be engaged in such a, like a, like a, uh, um, like a, like a Stockholm kind of uh, holds uh, with the movie that I'm watching. Uh, but oftentimes I am in the mood, and I think that's when I enjoy myself the most, going to the movies or watching TV show. Um, yeah, right here. Um, hi, thanks for the talk, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a question about, I guess, your process for making things in general. So this, this idea of like games for the gut, or like from the gut, gut-like, um, it's very like, like almost impossibly personal, that it's like about all these things that are like nonverbal, like impossible to verbalize. And uh, I wonder how you, like if you work with other people on a project like this, how do you like get these ideas across? And like, like if you have to justify things, like how does that work? How do you, how do you deal with this? Yeah, I think uh, I, I have a sort of an advantage because I am, I do a lot of visual design and I am versed in it. So I think visual design is a really good tool for getting across uh, ideas that are not possible to be verbalized uh, because pictures speak uh, a thousand words. Um, and also I think once people can touch or see a thing, they're more easily convinced uh, of a feeling. Um, but obviously sometimes what I do is, is uh, get to know these people get to know what, what makes them tick and speak in their language uh, and have them kind of trust me um, so that when I say something will work, work uh, they have some grounds to kind of take my word for it as well. Um, I, think, yeah, I think that's like the, the, the scariest part about collaborating as an artist is that you have to take, it, take everything so personally, especially talking about ideas that you believe in. And um, I think visuals definitely help. Um, how, how can... How big was the team when you were in uh, Squeenix? Uh, like, what was that like? Was that like a, uh, what was it? Paint us a picture a little yeah, bit about yeah, what, so, what, what that working process was. Uh, like. I believe, I think it's like a total of like 60 to 70 people at any given time at that studio. Uh, but there are teams, there are groups that are, are working on specific projects. I think at any, at a point I was working uh, with maybe, uh, you know, as small as like four or five uh, to like 20. Um, and uh, as a game designer, I would be basically, uh, you know, um, leading meetings and things like that uh, where we are discussing the next steps uh, of a game uh, on a both emotional level because I think everyone has to kind of be on board on an idea for anything to get made mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a scale of, uh, of that production, uh, so the production of that scale. So, yeah, I think... Was it... Here's what I'm picturing. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Pristine, minimalist, stylish yeah. office yeah. with like beautiful furniture, yeah. bowls of candy. Yes. Like, was it like that or was it like messy gamer culture, like gamer fuel, yeah. monster energy drinks? I, I think I was like privileged with uh, uh, working at a studio that's pretty small scale. I think uh, it's a double A company. Um, so. It does feel like, at a point, your second home because you're coming there uh, nine to five every every day, uh, every weekday, um, and it does. It, it's like it's like an open space. The place that I was working at, uh, there's no cubicles, uh, there's no um, doors really, um, and yeah, and, and everyone's kind of encouraged to uh, kind of 
jump between teams and, and talk about ideas. Uh, it's kind of like a startup, or what okay. you would imagine a startup might be. And um, did you, if I can keep going on yes, the details, yes. I don't want to, um, don't share anything you don't need to, but okay. like, did, did you use um, this, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of um, development process did you use? Did you use this thing uh, like, a, like an agile style process? Yeah, yeah, did, yeah, you yeah. Scrum, yeah, yeah. did you have scrum? Did you have stand-ups? Like, what was that like? Yeah, there would be sort of uh, stand-ups every day, uh, which is where we all stand up and, and talk about what we have done, what we have to do, uh, what's blocking us. Uh, and you have points and pigs and personas no, and... No. Okay. I think, I think uh, Square Enix Montreal is like, I think, very humane in that way, that they are very uh, developer uh, kind of oriented um, in that, uh, however, the developers kind of feel like they want to run a, a team or the development <laughs> process, it's ultimately kind of up to them and their, and their manager. Um, so... Again, it's a it's a very it's a very rare company in that way. I think a lot of other uh, big scale studios have to adhere to those kind of things of mm. like uh, performance um, over over quality of life. Yeah. Um, another question. Uh, was speaking French out of curiosity? Was speaking French a requirement for working at Square Enix? Uh, it, it was not, but uh, everyone was uh, sort of uh, francophone or bilingual, um, and. I understand a little bit because I am Canadian. I think I, was, uh, I had to learn a little bit of high school French, uh, but it's not required. But Square Enix Montreal also offers French lessons and also Japanese lessons because its, uh, it's mother company is, is a Japanese company. Uh, but I didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have, yeah. OK, first off, thank you very much for giving this talk. Um, I was wondering, you, I think you mentioned, you said this kind of fast, but I think you said that you're making, um, is it Love Game? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you're making that with your sister? Yes, I am. Okay. Oh, she's here? Yes. Oh. Hey, I hope you don't mind that. I just called attention to you. Uh, what is that like, making a game with your sister, and have you made games together before? Uh, I mean, the thing about uh, my sister and I, is that ever since I think we were very, very young, we would always start projects and we would start uh, ideas and then like kind of taper off because we would have other, other stuff going on. Um, and uh, so she's a playwright, she's also a TV writer. Uh, I'm not a writer. Uh, and this game is, I think, uh, is, a, is a very story driven and narrative game. So I kind of like, we do kind of like an idea bouncing off each other. We talk about how. Uh, good games feel like a good place, and there's a lot of kind of like overlap there uh, in terms of um, what they're trying to do with their audience. Um, yeah, I think it, it's it's I think it's uh, precisely because I think um, my sister and I are so uh, close, and also we kind of share uh, mind and soul um, that there's not a lot of like conflict or anything like that. It's more just like. Uh, we're, we're just differently busy, <laughs> so um, it's been like mostly solo dev so far, uh, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get to collaborating. We're going to go here and then, and then back to you. Uh, yeah, you just on what you just said, how good games feel like good plays, can you elaborate on that? Oh, sure. Um, so I think... Uh, the, the thing about plays uh, is, I mean, I live with two playwrights uh, often, so I, I feel like I have a sort of disparagement against a playwright because I've got to live with them and they're so finicky and they, you know, have all these constraints about uh, what, how they feel. And, um, <laughs> but the thing is, like, I think, for example, uh, one of my favorite plays are, uh, like, uh, by Bertolt Brett. I think Bertolt Brett is a uh, playwright who, is, who has a lot of interactivity in, in his uh, plays. So engagement with the audience is the whole point. Um, and kind of like, I think that's the thing that I also draw a lot of uh, inspiration from is like Brett's plays and their ability to kind of like uh, speak meta about its own medium um, as well as like this idea of like uh, constraint, uh, structuralism and like formalism and, and talking about ideas as a as a as a thing, as a kind of like a wall around um, like like a water uh, and that feeling very violent and that feeling very um, claustrophobic. Those are the, I feel like the messages in his in a lot of his plays are things that I do draw from uh, when I'm making games that are trying to kind of um, mess with this kind of constraints and the boxes around them. Um, 
uh, Brecht uh, famously very political, polemical, um, but uh, I believe once said, uh, uh, the theater must first and always entertain. If it doesn't entertain, there's no point right. to the polemic, yeah. um, and which is kind of surprising coming from Brecht, but it does strike me as uh, very much resonating with, yeah, yeah. with how you think about games. Right. Yeah. Um, so you tend to make games that tend to go against the current norms, that go against the that go against the current really, um, and you've done that with Bad Blood again with the with a the theme of violence and with this current game with love. Are there any big unique topics or concepts that you wish to explore? And feel free to dodge the question if you don't want to oh, reveal okay. anything. Oh, uh, so. I'm working on another game uh, with a friend, uh, a previous colleague at Square Enix Montreal, and it's a game uh, called Mild Demons, um, and it's about the self a little bit and our relationship with, with uh, our, our inner demons uh, and uh, how we kind of cope and reckon with them. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of a... And the thing that I like about that game is that uh, through the development, uh, he and I are, can talk about, like, uh, what moves us in games that that have like demons in them, and like uh, sort of like for example, like games like Persona uh, has uh, sort of a narrative that is like we all have this kind of um, sort of protector slash uh, uh, sort of personification of the, our darkest forms, uh, and what that might look like, what that come out as as a visual uh, form. Those are the things that I'm kind of interested in exploring uh, for that game. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm trying not to like take so many uh, holes before I can uh, fill them. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of focusing on those things right now. All right, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about music. I remember in one of the original trailers for Bad Blood, yeah. you found this, I don't know if it was White Stripes or Jack White song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was... Bad Brother. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Cuts Like a Buffalo. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it was really good and powerful. And, and a good song can often be the key of a, of a great trailer. Um, uh, do you draw inspiration from music? What are your music listening habits like? Yeah. Can you share a little bit of what you listen to. Yeah, so I think um, I listen to uh, music for the lyrics most often. I think that's the, yeah, the thing that really drives me is like I hear a line that really resonates and I want to make art around it or a game around it mm. and things like that. Um, that song I think is, was a real, I grew up with that song as in like, I think I first listened to it when I was in high school. Um, and uh, so the line goes, um, she looks like, uh, it was something like she looks like a woman, but she cuts like a buffalo, yeah. um, which is a, which is like a sentiment that I felt like really fit well with Bad Blood, yeah. uh, which was these like, uh, especially I think like characters in, in Bad Blood, such as like Mechanic, uh, who is this um, uh, like kind of a sort of a light uh, build uh, lady, but she has a hammer uh, that she basically like clobbers people with. Um, the kind of dissonance between our our uh, what we kind of present as, as as human beings and as our forms, but the kind of like the fire and the passion within us and how um, that comes out in our in our kind of violent actions. I think that's the thing that I was drawing from. Are there any songs that um, are serving the same function for for love? Do you have anything? It was yes. the soundtrack yeah. of love. Yeah, there's like a definitely like a Spotify playlist that I'm that I'm filling up. Give us a couple of uh, uh, names. Let's see. Um, there's uh, what's a, what's a song from that? Thing? Do you remember a song? Too? Oh yeah, yeah. This is a French song called "Love Me." Um, <laughs> um, there's also uh, I think temporary or like a like a old French. I think like it's a, a, it's an old French. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the the artist right now. Um, I think I think any song that has these lyrics that are like very very overwrought and uncaring about how embarrassing it is. I think those are the and like I'm really into like emo music music that are like kind of like wailing about uh, all the all the kind of Leonard Leonard Cohen is Canadian. Leonard Cohen, hundred percent. Can I yeah. can I get back to the Canadian thing a little bit? Leonard yeah, Cohen. sure. Yeah. I, I keep forgetting that that Canadian pride. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think especially when uh, when you're doing solo development and you're not constantly talking with another person, I think having a voice in your head that's kind of giving you constant inspiration and conversation, uh, I think is is really important. And I think music does do that. Listen to podcasts. 
Yeah, but only in like commutes. I don't usually listen to it when I'm working on, on creative stuff because I get like, I start to get like angry and stuff, which is not a, like a feeling that goes well with creation. I'm just like, yeah, you're right. And it's so, like that session. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions, right? Hi, so um, violence was the main like element in the talk, but um, there was a, like love was also briefly mentioned in it. And I always found the two to be like deeply similar, like, like um, when you were talking about uh, rodents' revenge, yes, um, like you said something about like coming to terms with the fact that the cat can be very violent to you and the chasing and everything of it, but by understanding that you can also be as violent yeah. to it, you get to understand like you come to terms with this violence. Like that word, if you replace the word violence with love, it still stands the same. It's it's a sentence from either a uh, you know a, a dual note or a love love letter, mm -hmm. right? Like it's so. Do you find this commonality and uh, between these two games, grammatical different games that you're making? Yeah, yeah. I think for sure. Um, I think also the thing that I said about um, a lot of these dating games that I've been playing and I've been enjoying felt like capitalism because it is kind of like a one-way system where um, I'm just like you know. Paying, paying my affection uh, to this person, and they're kind of giving, rewarding me with their presence and rewarding me with their um, uh, affection back. And I think that's the thing that I want to kind of um, talk about in this game: is that uh, love is a, love is a capacity. It's, an, it's a verb for most. It's not an, uh, an object. It's not a noun. So it's like I want uh, the the players to both uh, understand that they are, they have the capacity to, to give love, but also they have to earn that, uh, and also um, that have to be, and, and kind of, as you said, like come to terms with the fact that, um, uh, you know, we are the same, and we are all wanting to be loved and wanting to sort of receive love, uh, and it's about kind of uh, reaching that standard, uh, and, and everyone has to do it, it's not, um, it's not like, oh, I'm here and I'm ready if you uh, want to come over and tap me on the shoulder and tell me that uh, you want to be with me. Sure. It's, it's like, it's a sort of a, a two-way system in that sense. So for sure. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. I'm gonna go over here. Yeah. Um, so you talked a lot about the like different kinds of visceral feelings that your gut can give you, like, you know, feeling sick to your stomach or hunger and stuff. And I'm just wondering, do you have any opinions on like what specifically the like feeling of satiety or like fullness, like how that fits into that schema? So like, is that also meaningful? Or do you ever think about that when you uh, create work? So yeah. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this feeling of like uh, fullness or, or satisfaction is not necessarily comfort. Uh, I think it's something that just the fact that you are. Um, kind of reached uh, capacity in your in your consumption is definitely a state of thing of being that we can talk about through games um, and uh, yeah I think I think um, I kind of talked about like bloatedness uh, which I think is something that I feel sometimes in games that move me is that uh, too much of a good thing or too much of a thing that I, I'm, I'm comfortable with and um, and I feel I see myself uh, at the end of like a four hour gaming period uh, in which I have just like feel, gorged myself uh, with things that I that satisfies me uh, that gives me pleasure kind of like junk food I guess or, or fast food um, yeah so I think 100% um, Winnie thank you so much this has been amazing you are incredible um, this game looks Tremendous! This new game. When can we? When can we expect to see some? I've been really busy is, with uh, being a full-time faculty yes. here, uh, but I, I'm definitely working on it, and I'm um, excited to kind of show it around. Okay, good. So, so it's too early to say that there's a street date for love, but um, we can wish list it somewhere. Or um, I'm so uh, happy to have you as a colleague, and 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 welcome aboard. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you, Winnie Thong. <laughs>